morning, and welcome to Mineral Springs Online. We're so glad that you could be here with us this morning. Sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the sermon. Good morning, Mineral Springs. It is good to be able to come to you right in your living room to share with you the Word of God from His Holy Scripture. We're going to be looking this morning at Isaiah chapter 6. It's one of my favorite passages in all of God's Word. So I pray you will get your Bible, turn to Isaiah 6, because we are going to be walking verse by verse through the first seven verses of this great passage. Lord willing, we will look next week at the remainder of Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm looking forward to that already. But turn with me, if you would, as we're going to talk about a subject that a lot of Christians, when you talk about this subject, they just they look at you like they're in the zone. They get that dead look on their face, like they're not paying attention. Sometimes they look at you like you got two heads, like you got something coming out of you, because it's, it's just foreign. It's like you're speaking another language to so many believers. And that is that we're going to talk about the glory of God. A lot of folks, when you talk about the glory of God, they think, oh, preacher, can't you get back to the end times? Can't you get back to something practical like my marriage, my children? Do something, but not this abstract, big idea thought about the glory of God. Listen, one of the most practical things for you and for me is that we focus on during any time, but particularly in a time of crisis, how our God is amazingly glorious. And so turn with me now, Isaiah chapter 6, as we're going to read verses 1 through 7. The Word of God says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two He covered His face, With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we come now. We come in the powerful, precious name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do thank you. We praise you that you have in your infinite wisdom, Lord, you have decided to show us who you are by your scripture. Lord, the, the, you, the creator of all the universe, love us and care for us and want us to know you and to see the glory of God. Lord, it should excite us, it should astound us, and it should amaze us. And God, I pray that this morning, as your church sees this uh, video, I pray, Lord, that they would come closer to you because of what your Scripture teaches us. Father, I ask now that you work, that you use me as your messenger, hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that those who do not know you who would see this message would see what an amazing God there is, and would want to turn and to come to Christ because of how awesome you are. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, dear ones, as we look at this passage of Scripture, 
we are given Isaiah's introduction to who God is. This is a prophetic vision that Isaiah had. And so he is told, he records this vision of what God gave him to see so that you and I can look at this and we can know who God is and see and take a, a snapshot, if you will, of the grandeur of God from this marvelous vision. The first thing that I want you to do this morning, number one, is to behold God's glory. Behold God's glory. The glory of God is what is put on to display in these first verses that we see the awesomeness of the Creator God of all the universe. He is the God of Israel. And notice what Isaiah does here. If you would, look back in verse 1 of chapter 6. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, some have uh, said that that is not necessarily the year that he died, but it's when he was smitten. That word died can be, can be used differently. It was known that Uzziah, we believe, had contracted leprosy. And so that it may be when he first contracted leprosy and not his death year. And so that's just food for thought and put that out there. He says, I, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord l sitting on a throne. It is interesting here that Isaiah uses the word for Lord that is translated Adonai. He sees the Lord Adonai, not the proper name of God, which your Bibles will usually have in all capital letters when it uses the word Lord. So when you see Lord in all capital letters, that is that holy name of God, Yahweh. The tetragrammaton, the four-letter word that the Hebrew Masoretic scholars would never put the vowels on because they were very protective of the name of God. He says again, he is high and lifted up. He is exalted. It shows that God's glory is great. His status is always exalted. And then we get this picture, the train of His robe filled the temple. That the, the literal robe that He would wear was so big because He is so awesome that it takes up and flows over into all of the temple where Isaiah is. And so, dear ones, we see just a picture here of how awesome God is in this first verse. And we'll talk about it more in a minute, but I want to show you a picture. If you'll look, you'll see this picture of an artist's representation of what these angelic beings may look like. Now, I believe they're not exactly like this, and, but it gave me just a scope. I always pictured, in my little mind, I always pictured these angels being smaller creatures for some reason, about the size of, of well, me. In my mind, I saw them, I pictured Isaiah there, and in my imagination, I pictured those angels there, and they were real small and real tight together. And this artist, uh, Rob Joseph, has the picture, and as you see, I believe, standing there on that mount is to be Isaiah. And then look at just how large that angelic being really is. I think that is better than what I had in my mind um, because we have other scriptures that we'll get to that talk about these angelic beings. So again, notice in verse 1, when we behold the glory of God, we need to see that the Lord is throned. Now, let's cut to the chase. Who is this that Isaiah sees? This is none other than the Lord Jesus, the Son he sees sitting upon this throne. We have a lot of Scripture that we could look at. Luke uh, quotes it that shows that Isaiah sees Jesus. We have John. We'll see uh, other places, but notice here, it says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. He is king. He is in charge. He is ruling from on high. And that is the picture that you and I need to keep in the forefront of our minds. 
When there's a catastrophe, when there's a problem, when there's something that's going on like it's going on in our country now, we need to be reminded Jesus is sitting on the throne. Jesus is in complete control. And for Christians, for the believer, we don't have to worry because our God reigns from on high. He is completely sovereign. He is the one who is in control. No one can say to him, why do you do this? Or ward off his great and mighty hand. So, dear Christian, be comforted. Jesus sits upon the throne. Not only does he sit upon the throne, but the Bible says that he is high and lifted up. He is in a place of high stature. Um, he is the highest. He has the name above every name. That is our Lord Jesus. When we look at his robe, um, we think of a robe nowadays, and you probably think of a graduation gown, you think of a bathrobe, you think of something silly, right? We don't, we don't have robes. We don't see kings and queens very often. We see people who want to dress up and, and make themselves feel important. But true royalty we're not familiar with in our culture. Well, in Isaiah's day, uh, the king would wear a very uh, big robe. And the, the way the robe looked was a reflection upon the king and very often upon his kingdom. And so here we see the picture is that our Lord Jesus is sitting upon the throne and the train of his robe is so big that it fills the vast temple in which he sits. That the temple is not big enough to hold his glory. That's part of the picture that I want you to see and to understand as we talk about the glory of God. We see um, God's glory just all over this first verse. And John talks about this in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 39 through 41, he says, Therefore, they could not believe. Why could they not believe? For again, Isaiah said, and this is quoting the latter part of this chapter, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. And verse 41 says, Isaiah said these things. Why? Because he saw his, that is Jesus' glory, and spoke of him. And so, church, Isaiah most certainly sees the Lord Jesus Christ here. He is looking upon the Lord Jesus. He is seeing our Lord Jesus in this way, in this awesome vision of, of what is to come, and it's a wonderful thing that you and I uh, should think about that our Lord Jesus, oh, to see Him, oh, to be able one day where we won't have to worry about the pictures that all fail and do not do justice to His glory, but that we will be in the presence of the very Creator of our universe, the Savior of our souls, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This picture that we are given uh, is not the only picture that we are given in Scripture. Now, you may have pictures in your home that portray angels or portray the Lord Jesus, and I'll just say this lovingly, they all fail, okay? Uh, no offense, you can be offended, that's okay, but they fail. They're, they're not even close, all right? Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14 shows us a picture of what it is that the Lord Jesus looked like upon the cross when Isaiah prophesied about it. And he says this, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. They had beaten him so badly that he didn't look human. And his form beyond that of the children of mankind because of what they did to our Lord Jesus at the crucifixion, He looked so horrible, we could say. Isaiah prophesies about this in Isaiah 52 and verse 14. I've heard some scholars say, oh, that's not what this passage means, and they're just simply wrong, because it is very clear, it is very clear 
that Isaiah is showing this picture of our Lord Jesus that points to the crucifixion. Well, we have another picture that we're given of the Lord Jesus, and that is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and following, where the Bible says, And one of the elders said to me, this is the Apostle John who is crying because no one can open this perfectly sealed seal, uh, scroll. He says, weep no more. Behold, look, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we could talk and have a whole message about that phrase right there. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 6, in between the throne and the, notice this, four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. He's told, look at the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then he looks and he sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain with Seven horns, which represents perfect power, with seven eyes, which represents his omniscience that he knows and sees all, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, which represents his omnipresence that he is everywhere. And so, dear ones, we get these pictures of the Lord Jesus because we are to remember, even in the Old Testament, the glory of God that was shown to us in, in through the prophecies shows us Jesus in His glory, and one day we will see Him in His glory, but He will still have those nail-scarred hands. He will still, we will still remember, and we will know then in fullness of all that He went through on the cross. The glory of God is in part intrinsically tied to what our Lord Jesus did on the cross. We celebrate Easter, we celebrate His resurrection, but let us not forget that our Lord died and He is resurrected from the grave never to die again. So behold, behold, spend time thinking about the glory of God and how awesome our God is. But number two, number two, hear the glorious call. Listen to what happens when these angelic beings... Here we are given a picture of what it is like to see these angels have a worship time where they are worshiping God Almighty. Notice what happens. Notice here, verse 3, the Word of God says, these angelic beings, one called to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. These seraphim, which I believe are, in fact, the four living creatures of Revelation. I believe they are uh, the ones that we see in, in the Old Testament as well, in the prophets. But they say the same thing that these four living creatures say in the book of Revelation. And this is so important. Some of you have heard me go over this many times. Some of you may have never heard this. But in the Hebrew language, there was not the way that we have a superlative in English. If I wanted to say that, you know, this is the best steak I've ever eaten, I would say, this is the best steak I've ever eaten, right? In Hebrew, they don't have the word best, okay? And so they would say, this is the steak of steaks. This is the steakiest steak I've ever had, right? That's how we get the phrase, he is the king of kings. That he rules all the kings. He is the kingest. He is the most king. He is the lord of lords. He rules over all of those lesser lords. The Song of Solomon is called the Song of Songs. It is the greatest song. Well, here, we have something very special. And I know most of you are not grammarians. But if you were, this would stick out 
so much. Because it occurs only twice in all of the Scripture where there is in triplicate this usage of a, an expression like this to say something about the character of God. In fact, it only occurs twice and it's here in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 and it is also in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. There are these four living creatures. I believe they are the same as Isaiah's. Each of them with six wings and they're full of eyes all around them and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Listen, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now notice again, what does it say in Isaiah 6, 3? It says this, they call one to another and they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The same phrase being used leads me to believe, and, and no, I wouldn't die on this hill, but I believe these are the same angelic beings that we get in Isaiah. We see them again in Revelation. And the whole earth is full of His glory. And so, again, these four living creatures, this holy, 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 lets us know this glorious call about God as Isaiah is introduced to and allowed to see God. Why is it so important? Well, I believe it's so important because this is showing us, I believe, the supreme characteristic or the supreme attribute of our God. And you want to talk about some good theology. What characteristic is the top of all characteristics for God? Well, if you ask that question to many Christians, most of them would say something like this. Oh, well, He's loving. Oh, well, He's uh, powerful. Oh, well, He's just. Oh, he's good, but I believe, dear ones, the correct answer, and I'm convinced from this passage, from the Scripture in general, is that God, above all of the other characteristics that He has, though they are awesome, He is above all else, holy. He is other than you. He is other than me. He is different. He is pure. He is clean. He is righteous altogether. And that describes just a little bit of His holiness. I'll say this. The holiness of God is the foremost characteristic of God. God's holiness is at the top of the list of God's attributes. It is higher than His love and more than His justice. God is holy in all of His other attributes. That when you look at God, He is holy in His love. He is holy in His sovereign will. He is holy in His justice. And all that we see of our God, we can say, that's holy. That's holy. You might ask, well, someone will no, way, no doubt ask, well, why does this matter? Pastor Jake, why does this matter? You know, let's just get, you know, when we cannot think about the vital nature of understanding the very Word of God and the image of Christ, dear ones, that's a problem, okay? It, why does it matter? Because we're not talking about trivial things here. Most of our life, and I'm a pastor, right? I'm a pastor, I love theology, I study God's Word, and most of those things I talk about are trivial things. In, in my day, right? Things that aren't going to matter in a thousand years. What I had for lunch isn't going to matter in a thousand years, right? But it is going to matter what we think about and what we talk about God because it all matters when you talk about Jesus. Bless God. Every instance, every glimpse, the backside glory will light up your world and for all to see. They might want to put a veil and a cover over you when you think about the glory of God because it all matters. And So let's look at this. I want to say, but the call is not finished 
with only declaring God's holiness. Notice this. The call concludes with declaring His universe-wide observable glory. Listen. Look back. Chapter 6, verse 3. The whole earth is full of His glory. What does that mean, dear ones? What does that mean, Christian? What does that mean, skeptic who may be watching this? That means this. That every individual on planet earth that has a mind to think, they will be held accountable for who God is. Because when they wake up in the morning, and they look up and they see a sun, when they go to bed at night and they see a moon, when they see the mountains, when they see the trees, when they see the waters, when they see the face of a, a child, the beauty in another human being, it is all screaming. There is a Creator who is glorious. There is a God who is awesome. And so, uh, I listened to uh, a message, actually a, a comedy routine, really a Christian comedian, uh, over Easter break. And he gave the example of just how crazy it is to believe that this all came from random chance. That it is literally takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. He said this, his, his example, he said, what if I took off my watch and I took every single piece off of my watch and I put it in a bag and I shook that watch up for four billion years, six billion years, what are the chances that that watch is going to come out and it's going to be put together perfectly and it's going to be exactly right on time? What are the chances, what are the odds of that? And then he lets people think and he says, you know, this world is so much more complicated than a wristwatch. It takes so much faith to be an atheist, to believe that this is all random chance. It is not. The heavens declare the glories of God. Every, everything on this earth talks about His glory. I'll say this, even every virus declares the glory of of God. Every sickness, every, it shows our fragility. It shows how we are weak. This world, the world, has been shaken to the core. I don't know if you're watching the news, if you're just tired of watching the news and want to have uh, an escape from it. D don't stick and be glued to the TV all the time. You'll get depressed, right? Look to Jesus. That'll lift you up. Praise Him and thank Him. But they're talking about how now this virus might be mutating. You might be able to catch it. They don't know. They don't know. And we don't know. But here's what we do know. That our God is holy. And that every blade of grass that grows, every gnat that flies around in the air, is declaring there is a Creator. There is a God who is awesome. And I pray that you see that God. And I pray that you look to Him. And I pray that you trust Him now because this is, it's vital for us to do. What we have done, what we've become accustomed to in our world is assuming things, right? We assume a lot of things. Let me just give you a list. We assume in the morning when we wake up, we're still going to have our home. We assume with every breath <gasps> that we'll be able to take one. We assume the food that we will eat the next day. We assume we're going to have our health, our wealth, that nature, that the world is going to be as it is. We assume we're going to have toilet paper. But you know what? This whole thing that's happened, it, it's, it's shaking that up and it's letting people know there's a God who's in charge. It's not me. It's not you. It's the King of kings and the Lord of glory. The whole earth, the Bible says, look, the Bible says the whole earth is full of His glory. And we go right to Psalm 19 where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, 
and night to night reveals knowledge. It says, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. In other words, the whole world knows there is a God. Creation screams. Creation demands the glory of God to be praised. And so I pray for me, I pray for you that we realize the glory of God is everywhere. Back to Isaiah, and please look with me at verse 3 and 4, where he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then it says, The foundations of the thresholds, the very temple itself shook. And the voice of Him who called, at the voice of Him... Even, this is, can you imagine what would happen if God spoke? This is just His messenger. And then it says, And the house was filled with smoke. And so, dear ones, the very declaration of God's glory by the angelic beings causes the whole of creation to shake and to fill up with smoke at the call of the glory of God. And so you might be asking now, if, you, if you've really been convinced of this and you see what Isaiah has seen and, and you're reading the Bible and you're understanding this is how awesome, this is how amazing the Creator is, you might say, what do I do? What, what in the world can I do? Well, number three, our last point this morning, repent in response. Repent in response. What does it mean to repent? To repent means this. To repent means to turn from one direction and to go to do an about face. If you're going this way to repent, you're turning around and you're going this way. That's what it means to repent. To go the other way. To leave. To stop sin and to turn to God. And so for you this morning, do you have that relationship with Jesus? You can't stop sinning until you come to the Savior. Okay? You cannot have a relationship with God until you admit that you're a sinner. You, you say, God, I can't do this. I'm going to turn away from this sin. I'm going to turn to you. And you look unto the Lord, and you call out to the Lord to be saved. You believe Jesus died on the cross for sinners. You believe that He is able to save. And you call upon Him for salvation. That changes. Then God begins a work in you to change you from the inside out. And He will do that when we trust in Him and look to Him. Look at what Isaiah does now. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, the Bible tells us Isaiah's response, this prophet's response, he says, Woe is me! Why? For I am lost. Some translations say, For I am ruined. Why? I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell with the people who have unclean lips. And now look, my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. And so... What does this all mean? It means this, that when Isaiah is confronted with God, he knows, he realizes who he is. And so I want to tell you something. There is a, this is a true statement, dear ones. You will not go any further in your introspection into knowing yourself until you know God. And you will not go any further in knowing God until you look and realize who you are. Okay? This is what happens when we're confronted with God. When we see God with Isaiah, he turns from his sin. He realizes he's a sinner. He talks about his lips. He talks about his words. He talks about what he says. I wish there are things this week I wish I could take back. I don't know about you. Maybe you're just good with keeping your mouth shut. But what about your thoughts? What about your actions? What about you don't? What the things that you don't do that you should do? right? All of that is sin. And so we want to please God. We want to love Him. Back to verse 5. He says, Woe is me, for I am lost. When Isaiah was confronted with the glory of Christ Jesus, he recognizes the curse of sin on him. The curse of sin. He says, Woe. This means he's cursed. He's lost. He's ruined. He's destroyed. That's what this means. And he says, Notice this, for I am a man of unclean lips. He 
notices that he has unclean lips. The book of James, another one of my favorite books in the New Testament because it's so practical, it tells us this. The tongue is a fire. The, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. Setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. That's what the Bible says about our tongues. Yes, Isaiah talks about the lips. The t- it means this. Jesus said it's out of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's why this is so important. If you can tame your tongue, you've got it made. The problem is we can't do it. It is only by the grace of God that we can withstand. And so when Isaiah talks about himself and realizes who he is because of his speech, it should be something that you and I think about ourselves and say, okay, Lord, Lord, where do you need to continue to sanctify me? If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, God, where do you need to sanctify me in my speech? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 reminds us of what every tongue will one day do. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted Him, that is the Lord Jesus, who is in Isaiah's vision sitting upon the throne, and bestowed on Him the name that is what above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Spend time today, this Lord's Day, and say, Lord, what is it that I need to repent of, that I need to turn away from, that I can turn to you? And if you're not yet a Christian, you need to turn your whole life to Him. And that means you put everything on the table. And if you're a Christian, uh, tonight Pastor Patrick is going to talk about how we don't want to be hypocritical. And so we need to put everything out and say, Lord, everything, everything is yours. That's my prayer for you. So in, in review, behold God's glory. Spend time thinking about the glory of God and how awesome He is. Behold His glory. Hear the glorious call of these angelic beings. Holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is filled with His glory. And thirdly, what do we do? We repent. Daily, dear Christians, we need to go to the Lord and turn away from sin and turn to Him. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we praise You. We thank You, Lord, that You have blessed us so richly with Your Word that we can know that You are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and that You are holy, holy, holy. Thank You, God, that our Lord Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, a holy life, so that we could have that life put on our account if we are connected to Him by faith, by trusting in Him. Lord, we pray we would live for You. We pray that we would live in such a way that we think about Your glory, that we think how You are holy and therefore we want to be holy. God, that we would each day see how we need to repent and to turn and to make things right with You, that we can be the men and women and children that You want us to be in Jesus. In His holy name we pray. Amen. I love you, church. God bless you. I pray that you have a wonderful week. Lord willing, we'll see you again on Wednesday evening.